so excited to bring you this amazing panel of mycologists today, which are people who study fungi. And I just want to start off with a brief idea of what are the basics about fungi. So we're going to learn about fungi 101. And I wanted to start with this picture of a mushroom that I found on a walk through my uh, neighborhood recently. Just as a reminder that fall is a fantastic time to stop while you're walking and look for these mushrooms. And you don't have to be in a forest or a place like Algonquin to find them. You can look in any area that there's grass or soil or uh, trees and really see if you can find some of these beautiful fungi. So when I say fungi, many of you might immediately think of this quint quintessential fungi, which is this mushroom that's red with white spots. And this is an example of a macro fungi, which is a fungi you can see with your eyes and who has this big structure. What's really cool about this picture is I actually drew the picture of the mushroom with a micro fungi, which is a small fungi that you can't see with your eye. And in this case, I used yeast, uh, which is baker's yeast. And I just love this idea of using agar art, which anybody who knows me knows I love a ton. But also it gives us this idea of the diversity already, where you have these large fungi and these small fungi. And they're all related and they're all fun. When we think about fungi, we need to think about where do they belong in the tree of life? So we know that all living things are characterized into bacteria, archaea, or eukarya. And so we know that fungi actually are eukaryotes. And this is because they have many of the similar structures like nuclei and subcompartments. Um, and we also know that fungi are more closely related to animals than they are plants. And this is interesting because at first fungi were thought to be plants. And many of the first mycologists actually worked in ecology departments because of that. And this relationship between fungi and animals and humans will become really important for Joshua's talk later on today. So overall, when we look at the family of fungi, we have eight phyla, which are shown in the mushroom on the left in blue, as well as we have some examples of different kinds of fungi you may have heard of. Some of the general characteristics of all fungi are that they're chemoheterotrophs, which means they require carbon as a source from their environment. They often propagate with spores and spores of the tiny little um, kind of puffs of things that come out of the mushrooms that help them spread and grow more. And they also have cell walls and these cell walls often have chitin. Now, what's really cool about fungi is the vast diversity of them. And I'm gonna highlight just a little bit and first being the diversity of size. So as mentioned in the intro, Fungi are actually the largest organism on the earth, which may seem super surprising. There's this humongous fungus called Armillaria fungus, and it has these mushrooms above ground as well as this mycelial network underground. And estimates suggest that this fungi is over 2,500 years old and weighs over 400 tons, and that's larger than three blue whales. On the other end, we also have fungi that are among the smallest eukaryotes on the earth, and this is microsporidia. So these are unicellular fungi that are between one and four micrometers, and that's a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. So not only are they small, smaller than what you could see, and smaller than they're even smaller than those yeast or bakeries that are also impossible to see on their own. Now, when we talk about diversity of fungi, we can also talk about their function. And of course, an event called the good, the bad, and the ugly, I wanted to highlight a little bit of each of those. So first, we need fungi to live on this earth. And without fungi, it's estimated that the earth would be inhabitable. And some of the reasons for that are because of things like penicillium, which is a kind of fungus that makes penicillin. And penicillin was accidentally discovered in 1928 by Sir Andrew Fleming. And this um, penicillin and related antibiotics have saved countless lives and enabled life-saving surgeries um, because before people used to die when they had surgeries of these bacterial infections. So these fungi are really saving us through these antibiotics. Another example is that fungi in the soil recycle nutrients from dead and decaying organisms. And this is really essential because we have a limited number of nutrients on earth. And so these fungi are really responsible for bringing those back into cycle. Now, of course, we have to talk about the bad and crops uh, destroying fungi have been a threat to humanity for centuries. 
So currently right now, fungi are threatening our supply of rice, bananas, coffee, and recently I just read about how they're even destroying our pumpkin supplies this Halloween. And so this is really serious because so much of our population relies on these and other crops for food sources. It's not only crops that have to worry, fungi are also threatening many global ecosystems by wiping out populations of amphibians, bats, and much more. And lastly, we're going to talk about the ugly. There are definitely ugly fungi out there. And one example is the zombie, zombie fungus. And if you've heard any of my talks at the Science of Scary, you'll already know this. And if you haven't, you can review those talks. There are these species of fungi that infect and control insects in order to increase the spread of their fungal spores, which I think is pretty ugly. But one of my favorite things about fungi is that even though we know about all this diversity in their function, in their size, and how they look, there's still so much more to be discovered. So it is estimated that between 2.2 and 3.8 million species of fungi are on Earth, but over 93% have not been discovered yet. And so as we discover more about these fungi, we'll really get to see even more about how important fungi are for our life on Earth and beyond.